The county of Cumbria nestles between Bonnie Scotland and the great county of Lancashire. It is the home of Kendall Mint Cake, the outstandingly beautiful Lake District, bad form reception and one of the most disturbing mass shootings in British history. This is the case of Derek Bird, the Cumbrian killer. Derek Bird was raised in Rora, which is a tiny rural village just on the edge of the Lake District National Park. It has diverse wildlife, including lots of deer, barn owls, cuckoos, foxes, red squirrels, and it has a pair of nesting peregrine falcons. In April 2009, Rora made the national headlines when a pigeon laced with poison was used in an attempt to poison the peregrine falcons. In 2010, there were sightings of a large black cat. Local myth often refers to such unknown creatures as boggles. But in 2010, Rora hit the headlines for an entirely different and more terrifying tale. Derek Bird was born on the 27th of November 1957 to Joseph and Mary Bird. He was the youngest of three brothers, an elder brother Brian and a twin brother David. As a young man, he met a woman and had two sons. And the relationship started to crumble after the birth of the second son and it ended in the early 90s. Derek Bird was single for most of his life and he lived in a small pebble dash terraced house in the village of Rora. He lived a quiet, respectable life as a taxi driver. According to people who live nearby, Bird was the perfect neighbour. He was quiet, popular, friendly and he had a fun side. He was very generous. If he went to the local store to buy a pint of milk, he'd pay with a pound and he'd often leave the change. He was the sort of guy that would pass you in the street and say hello. He's a guy that you'd go to the pub with and have a quiet pint. So what made this quiet, gentle man turn into a mass shooter? Twins are often close, but not so much. Derek and David. The pages of a will left by Derek and David's father Joe provided an insight into the simmering tensions between the brothers and a substantial gap in wealth between the taxi driver Derek and his twin brother who became the first victim of his shooting spree. The documents uncovered at the probate registry in London reveal how Joe Bird, a civil servant for Cumbria County Council, gave David Bird a gift of £25,000 shortly before his death in 1998. Crucially, it made no such provision for other family members, including Derek. It was perhaps one of the several perceived injustices for Derek, including a suspicion that his twin brother was conniving with the family solicitor to exacerbate his difficulties with a tax bill. Could this be a catalyst to what became a murderous grudge? A family friend told the media, Derek thought his brother David was out to get him. That may cast some light on more than 20 years of contrasting fortunes for the twins, Derek and David. Both were divorcees and they spent their adult lives finding more and more to separate rather than unite them. While Derek, lived in a modest pebble dash terraced house worth about £90,000 in the native village of Rora. David, a mechanic and lorry driver turned building contractor, had succeeded in buying a substantial farmhouse worth around half a million pounds in a village called Lamplu, about four miles away from Derek's home. Could it be that this division ultimately drove a desperate Derek Bird, apparently haunted by fears that he was facing jail for an unpaid tax bill, to place his twin brother 
and the family solicitor at the top of his target list. So is it that it was his father's will that was the first nail in the coffin for Derek Bird and his twin brother David? The documents that show Joe Bird gave David £25,000, when looked at more closely, show that the will had a requirement that the sum of £25,000 be deducted from David's eventual inheritance. But there is no record of that money ever being paid back. And while Joseph's estate initially worth £200,000, debts and taxes reduced the eventual legacy to just £10,000, which was paid to his surviving wife, Mary. Derek and the twins' elder brother, Brian, received nothing. So this grudge that Derek might have had against David was not borne out in fact. But it's understood that money had been a sore point between the two brothers for years and years and years. David Bird, who had three grown-up daughters, seems to have been a canny investor working hard to buy High Trees Farm, a large farmhouse in the beautiful countryside of the village of Lamplu. And it was in the master bedroom of this property that Derek shot dead his brother at point-blank range. In contrast, Derek had no such canny investment. In 1990, Derek was dismissed from his job as a joiner at Sellafield Nuclear Power Station. He was caught for the minor offence of stealing building materials and given a 12-month suspended prison sentence. He started to fiddle his taxes. He became adept at salting away his earnings from his work as a self-employed taxi driver in nearby Whitehaven. When Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, the taxman, learnt of the sum in Bird's bank account, it seems formal steps were taken to recover an outstanding tax bill. The amount cited by Derek Bird was £10,000, but sources said the sum could have been as high as £100,000. Bird was increasingly convinced that he was facing imprisonment, but as far as Derek Bird was concerned, the problem was just the latest financial misfortune, and that misfortune was being exacerbated by his twin and their family solicitor. It emerged that Derek had been counting on his share of the proceeds of his mother's home, sold recently after she suffered a stroke in 2003, to pay off his debts. Sources suggested that David might have been reluctant to release the money or indeed surrender his share of Mary Bird's will in the event of her death. Thing is though, Mary Bird, at the time of the mass shootings, wasn't dead. She'd actually gone to live with Derek and he loved his mother and he cared for her. So given the amount of time that Derek was spending with his mother, perhaps he felt that when she did die, a larger share of Mary's wealth should go to him rather than his brother's. However, in a statement, David Bird's daughters insisted that there was no feud between the two brothers and their father had indeed sought to help Derek. Nonetheless, Bird's mood increasingly twisted by drinking binges and waves of paranoia about the motives of his family and friends and he perhaps decided his first two victims were central to his predicament. A source told the BBC that Kevin Commons, the Bird family solicitor, had refused Derek's pleas in the weeks before the murders to provide false testimony to the taxman that he felt would spare him prison. Such was Derek Bird's loosening grip on reality. He had come to believe that the professional steadfastness of Mr Commons was the result of a silent conspiracy between Mr Commons and his twin brother David. Kevin Commons, the Bird family solicitor, became Derek's second victim. But on this fateful day, Derek Bird not only killed his twin and the family solicitor, he went on to claim 10 more lives and left many with dreadful injuries. So in the early hours of Wednesday, the 2nd of June, 2010, Derek Bird left his home in Rora 
drove his Citroen Zara Picasso to his twin brother David's home in Lamplu and shot him numerous times in the head and body with his 22 calibre rifle. Bird was a keen shooter. He'd been shooting game for many years. He'd held a shotgun license and a rifle license for over 20 years. So he knew how to handle a gun and the first bullet alone would have killed David. But Bird, in a deranged state, fired a total of 15 bullets into David's head and body. Each of the subsequent shots would have proved fatal, according to a police report. The number of shots this overkill proves to people this was a crazed man. And it has been alleged that in the days and even weeks before the shootings, he was slowly losing grip on reality. Sources say that he'd drunk over 50 pints of beer in the three days before the shootings. The shooting of David Bird marked the start of Derek's rampage around rural Cumbria, killing a further 11 victims and injuring 11 others. Some of his victims, like his brother David, were known well to him, but others were strangers who were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. At Derek's funeral, which his family did attend, vicar Jim Marshall said he was dumbfounded at the level of forgiveness displayed by the family since Bird's murderous gun rampage. But at that funeral, Derek and David's surviving brother Brian, seen alongside his siblings in this school photo, was so distraught during the funeral service that he collapsed. A neighbour and close friend of Mary Bird, Derek's mother, said no one can believe Derek shot David so many times. His rifle was capable of firing five shots at a time, then it needed reloading. That means he must have reloaded it at least twice and kept on shooting. The family tried to think the best of Derek initially, thinking he must have shot David by accident as they fought over the gun. But it's hard to say it was an accident when he was shot 15 times. At that point, detectives had also learned the debt plague Derek Bird was angry about something else, that a 27,000 inheritance from his late cousin had not come through in time to bail him out of his tax arrears. So he was struggling. He was struggling financially, fearing he was going to go to prison. He decided on the worst possible course of action. His second victim was the family solicitor, Kevin Commons. Bird drove from Lamplu to Frizzington, arriving at the home of his family solicitor, Kevin Commons, around 10.20 a.m. Bird prevented Commons from driving away, firing twice with a double barrel shotgun, which he'd earlier sawn off. The barrel and the saw were later found in his home. It hit him once in the shoulder while Commons was trying to drive away. Commons staggered out of his car and onto the entrance to his farmyard driveway, where Bird killed him with two rifle shots to the head. Bird then turned his attention to his colleagues at the taxi rank in Whitehaven. A neighbour of Kevin Commons had heard gunshots and called Cumbria Constabulary to report the shooting. However, her call was delayed by several minutes after she asked neighbours what she should do. Meanwhile, Bird, reaching Whitehaven and the taxi rank where he worked on Duke Street, he parked up and called over Darren Rucastle, a taxi driver who was known to Bird. Bird had had previous conflicts with Rucastle. Bird had accused him of poaching fares from him and an incident where Rucastle damaged the tyres on his taxi and openly boasted about it. So there was a personal grudge here between Bird and Rucastle. When Rucastle approached Bird's taxi, he shot twice at point blank rage with the rifle, hitting him in the lower face, chest and abdomen. Rucastle died of his injuries, becoming the only person to die in Whitehaven during the attacks. But his attention to taxi drivers in Whitehaven wasn't over. After killing Rucastle, Bird drove alongside another taxi driver, Donald Reed, and shot him in the back, wounding him. 
Bird then made a loop back to the taxi rank and fired again at Reed, but missed. Next, Bird drove away from the taxi rank and stopped alongside another taxi driver called Paul Wilson as he walked along Scott Street. He called him over to his vehicle as he had done with Rue Castle. When Wilson came over, Bird shot him in the right side of his face with the sawn-off shotgun, severely wounding him. As a result of these shootings, unarmed officers at the local police station were informed and began following Bird's taxi as it drove onto Coach Road. However, Bird started firing his shotgun at a passing taxi, missing the driver, Terry Kennedy, and a female passenger, Emma Percival. Bird was able to flee the officers as he aimed his shotgun at them and, as they were unarmed, there's nothing they could do and it forced them to take cover. He didn't fire at them though, instead he took advantage of their distraction and their fear to escape. He was then on a rampage, shooting anybody in his path. The alarm was raised and a massive manhunt for Bird was launched by Cumbria Constabulary. Bird headed south and residents in Whitehaven and the villages of Egremont and Seascale were urged to stay indoors. Bird proceeded to drive through several local villages firing apparently at random and calling a majority of the victims over to his taxi before shooting them. By 10.55 he'd approached Egremont. Near there Bird tried to shoot Jacqueline Williams as she was walking her dog but she managed to escape without injury. Upon arriving in Agrimont about 10.55, he stopped alongside Susan Hughes as she walked home from shopping and shot her in the chest and abdomen with the shotgun. He then got out of his taxi and got into a struggle with Hughes before fatally shooting her finally in the back of the head with his rifle. Then, after driving a short distance to Bridge End, Bird fired the shotgun at Kenneth Fishburne as he walked in the opposite direction. Fishburne suffered fatal wounds to the head and chest. This was followed by the shooting of Leslie Hunter, who was called over to Bird's taxi before being shot in the face at close range with the shotgun. He hit Leslie a second time in the back after he turned away to protect himself. Miraculously, he survived his injuries. Bird then went south towards Thornhill, where he fired his shotgun at Astley Glaister, a teenage girl. However, thankfully, he missed her. He then passed Carlton and travelled on to the village of Wilton. There, he tried to visit Jason Carey, a member of the diving club Bird had belonged to. He was a keen scuba diver. But Bird left when Carey's wife came to the door. He didn't want to shoot his wife, clearly. He had something personal against Jason. Soon afterwards, Bird shot Jennifer Jackson once in the chest with his shotgun and twice in the head with his rifle, killing her. By 11 o'clock, Bird was driving past Townhead Farm, but he turned round, fatally shooting Jennifer Jackson's husband James in the head and wounding another woman called Christine Hunter Hall in the back. He drove back to Carlton and killed Isaac Dixon, a mole catcher, who was fatally shot twice at close range as he was talking to a farmer in a field. Then, a former semi-professional rugby player, Gary Purdom, was shot and killed while walking in a field outside the Red Admiral Hotel in Boomwood near Gosforth. By 11.20, Bird was driving towards Seascale. Along the way, he began driving slowly and waved to other motorists to pass him. He shot a motorist called Jamie Clark, who suffered a fatal wound to the head, although it was not clear at first whether he died from the gunshot or a subsequent car crash. Bird then encountered another motorist called Harry Berger at a narrow one-way passage underneath the railway bridge. When Berger allowed Bird to enter first, Bird fired at him as he passed by, shooting him twice and causing severe injuries to his right arm. By this time, three armed response vehicles attempting to pursue Bird were later blocked out of the tunnel by Berger's vehicle. That cost the cops a lot of time. Meanwhile, Berg had managed to drive on where he fired twice at Michael Pike, a retired man who was cycling in front of him. The first shot missed, but the second hit Pike in the head and killed him. Seconds later, on the same street, Bird fatally shot Jane Robinson in the neck and head at point-blank range after calling her over to him. After the killing of Jane Robinson, 
who was the final fatality of the shootings, witnesses described Bird as driving increasingly erratically down the street. At 11.33, police constables Philip Lewis and Andrew Laverack spotted Bird as his car passed their vehicle. They attempted to pursue, but were delayed in roadworks and lost sight of him a minute later. Soon after that, Bird drove into Estale Valley, where he wounded Jackie Lewis in the neck with his rifle. At this point, his route had become clearer to police during the search for him, so could they make any headway to catch him? But next, Bird stopped alongside Fiona Moretta, who leaned into his passenger window, believing that he was going to ask her for directions. He didn't ask her for directions. Instead, he shot her in the chest with the rifle and continued onwards towards the village of Boot. Arriving in Boot, Bird briefly stopped at a business premises called Sims Travel and fired his rifle at nearby people, but thankfully missed them all. He was becoming increasingly erratic and less focused in his shooting. But continuing further into the village, he continued firing at random people, but missing everyone. Bird eventually fired his rifle at two men, hitting and severely wounding Nathan Jones in the face. This was shortly followed by a couple who had stopped the car to take a photo. Samantha Christie suffered severe wounds in the face from a rifle bullet. Christie's partner, Craig Ross, fled upon Bird's instruction and was fired at as he ran away, but he did escape uninjured. Shortly after randomly firing at two cyclists, Bird crashed his taxi into several vehicles and a stone wall, damaging the vehicle. Briefly continuing onward, but not able to drive anymore, he abandoned his car at a beauty spot near Boot, named Dr Bridge. A nearby family of four, who were unaware of the shootings, offered assistance to Bird, but were quickly turned down and he advised them to leave. Was this a final act of mercy by Derek Bird? Bird removed the rifle from his taxi and walked over the bridge. He was last seen alive at 12.30. Armed police officers and dog handlers arrived at the scene of Bird's abandoned taxi and began a ground search in and around the wooded area. At around 2pm, Deputy Chief Constable Stuart Hyde announced that Bird's body had been found in a wooded area along with the rifle. Police confirmed that members of the public who had taken shelter during the incident could now resume their normal activities. The fear had been, given that Bird had been fired from Sellafield Nuclear Reprocessing Plant, that he would head there to create mayhem, and during the manhunt the gates were closed as a precaution, and the afternoon shift were told not to come into work. That was the first ever lockdown in history of that power plant. Whenever senseless murders like this occur, we always put our head in our hands and say, why? And no one would have expected this of Derek Bird. He was quiet. He was all right. He liked to drink down the pub. He would chat to anyone. His friends called him Birdie. He lived with his mother, who he loved dearly. He adored his sons. But in the main, he kept himself to himself. Yes, he'd been drinking more. He'd been drinking a lot in the days before the murders. He was worried about going to prison for tax evasion, but overall, he was a good bloke. That's what they thought about him anyway. In the days before the murders, his mood had changed a little bit and it had been noticed at the taxi rank where he worked. They used to wind him up a little bit. It was an easy wind up, nothing personal, nothing serious. Things like that he couldn't get a girlfriend or They'd pinch a fare and they'd wind him up over it. Banter, really. He didn't seem to mind. Or maybe he did. In his fragile state, maybe he really did. And that's why he targeted not only his brother and the family solicitor who he thought were doing him out of money in this secret conspiracy. He also wanted to have a go at his co-workers as well. There'd been a little bit of a bust up the day before and he was upset because other cabbies were, in his words, nicking his fares and taking the piss. He let them have it on that Tuesday before that fateful morning of Wednesday the 2nd of June 2010. Someone said he'd seen Birdie around and Birdie had said, you won't be seeing me again. And as he walked away, he mumbled something about a rampage. It wasn't like Birdie, not at all. 
Did anybody really know Derek Bird? Does anybody really know anyone? When you close the front door, you don't know what anyone's really like or what they're thinking, do you? Some knew that he had guns and he liked to go shooting. A few knew about his money worries and some business to do with his twin brother David and their father's will and their mother's will once she died. But only Birdie knew what Birdie knew, or was it all in his head? But on that fateful morning, Derek Bird was breaking news. News channels across the nation were saying things like, reports are coming in, there's been a series of shooting in the White Haven area of Cumbria. And then we all knew about Birdie. And Jane, Darren, Gary, Jamie, Susan, Isaac, Kevin, David, Kenneth, Michael, James and Jennifer. No one knew in their wildest dreams what Derek Bird was planning, but he did it anyway. Nobody really knows anyone, do they? Let me know what you think about this case in the comments below and I'll see you very soon in the next video. Bye guys.